Hello viewer and welcome. I'm here Bellare and this is your invitation to cryptography. People have liked cryptography and been fascinated by it for millennia now and there's several reasons for that. One of them is its intellectual interest and fascination. It's a place where you find beautiful ideas, philosophy which is turned into mathematics and interesting mathematical and algorithmic techniques. And yet, on the other hand, it's something that's eminently useful. Today, the use of cryptography is undeniable. Pretty much any time you visit almost any website, you're using significant amounts of it. We use it when we do cyber shopping, when we chat on message uh, messaging apps, when we do electronic banking, and a host of other specialized applications. Stepping back, of course, one might ask, but what is cryptography after all? And a typical answer would perhaps go into the types of problems that it usually addresses and the methods it uses to do that. And we'll do those kinds of things at some point. But I'll start with something a little less conventional, and it's done by analogy. There's a well-known book called The Story of Art in which E.H. Combridge introduces the reader to art. And as he's talking about a new subject, he is, of course, also faced with the question, oh, what is art after all? And his answer is, there is no such thing as art, really. There are only artists. Well, what does that mean? It just means that what we call art is the creation of certain minds and individuals. And those creations, their thoughts and their ideas, are what actually constitute the field. And here you can see a whole slew of different artists. The conception of art here is quite broad. It's not merely, as one might usually imagine, painting and music, though of course those are widely represented here, but even things like cooking or the creation of beautiful and powerful devices. So, a little puzzle for you. How many of these people can you identify and name? And I won't give you the answers. I'll leave you to do that and um, continue to suggest that cryptography is in the same position that it's not really a thing that exists in some standalone way, but rather as something that was created by cryptographers. And cryptography is what cryptographers do. It's a set of ideas developed by certain people and it has many different facets and a content that's very dependent on who created it and what they chose to put into it and what they chose to call cryptography. You can see here a slew of these people. Um, we might ask ourselves again, um, do you recognize any of them? Cryptographers have been very successful as far as winning computer science's most important award, the Turing Award. If we look at the people here, a significant number of them have won it. So Shafi Golwasser, Ron Rivest, Belohar, Heidi Shamir, Andy Yao, Silvio Micali, Whit Diffie, Martin Hellman, Michael Rabin are all cryptographers who won the Turing Award. And um, in case you're curious, a few others. Don Copperfield is generally viewed as the inventor of the DES algorithm. Uh, Nadia Henninger is a leading cryptanalyst. Dan Bonet is the inventor of identity-based encryption and many other things. Craig Gentry, the inventor of fully homomorphic encryption. Alan Turing, of course, um, the inventor of AES. Uh, Phil Rogaway, who's kind of the a leader in symmetric cryptography. And this group here is um, some of the cryptanalysts who 
were part of the Bletchley Park effort at uh, breaking British codes in the war. So as we approach this field, it turns effectively into a set of stories about what people like this and others have done, how they see the world, what problems they have looked to, how they have conceptualized things, and what ideas they have introduced, which are not necessarily always tied to basic problems, but are simply imaginative. Cryptography, as we look at it now, is evolving. It's still alive. It's not written in stone. People like this continue to construct it and change it. And eventually, it's a discipline which, like many others, is socially constructed in the sense that what we view it to be and how we attach value to its different elements is a matter of choice and opinion um, to, to a certain degree. It's perhaps worth keeping this in mind with regard to disciplines. Okay, so that was a bit of a um, non-standard definition or introduction to what um, cryptography might be taken to mean. Um, and something you might think about it is what does a phrase like that actually embody? Um, one could also ask more broadly what it means for a discipline to be socially constructed. I think it's a useful idea to have in mind looking at many other disciplines, including all of computer science. So let's start getting a little more into what makes cryptography special. And one of those things is the presence of an entity called the adversary. This is uh, unique to security and cryptography because most disciplines don't imagine this entity whose goal is to subvert whatever we are doing to turn it on its head and to take what we do and turn it to its own advantage. A fraction of what we do in cryptography is to think about the adversary, put ourselves in its place, understand its intentions, its goals, its powers, formalize and model what it can do, and eventually, hopefully, as much as we can, overcome its um, effects. These adversaries are visible if we care to look around the world. They're present in many things that are going on and we see their effects in, in daily action. We can identify a slew of basic goals that are prominent in cryptography. And some of these are privacy, authenticity, and very connected to authenticity is identity. And since these are pretty ubiquitous, let's try to develop them a little bit. Privacy pertains to hiding the content of information, or even more broadly, hiding other kinds of things. For example, I don't want anyone to see what I'm emailing to another person or what I'm typing into my messaging app in a chat with you or someone else. Beyond that, I don't want them to get um, information I consider private, like my social security number, credit card number, or medical records. These often because they can be exploited in ways that uh, would be harmful to me. Perhaps I don't want people to know what websites I visit, what purchases I make, where I travel, how much money I make, what I, who I vote for, how I entertain myself, or any number of a bunch of personal things or things I consider personal. Those have been viewed from a personal perspective, but you can also imagine more corporate or, or uh, collective goals. For example, a corporation doesn't want its uh, trade secrets or the source of its uh, products to be broadly known. Uh, they want to protect their technology. Governments may want to protect many aspects of their plans or, or their, again, their technology. We see political dissidents in various places who need to keep their identity secret in order to protect themselves. And so in this way, there is a broad 
uh, and broadening scope of things where we can ask ourselves to what extent we care whether people other than who we intend know about these things and anything like that is a privacy concern. Authenticity pertains to whether the information that you get is the same as the person who sent it meant you to get. For example, if I receive an email from someone, I want assurance that it wasn't modified along the way, but it was exactly what that person entered. Similarly, a chat message should be exactly what the person I'm chatting with actually said. Uh, I don't want information to be modified and I don't want it to be faked, meaning the person actually didn't send anything and someone else invented it. This is, of course, basic. It's, a, it's an element of communication integrity, but it also has repercussions. For example, changes to a medical record will alter uh, possibly my treatment in a way that might not be uh, very positive for me. Our bank accounts... Uh, need to be protected from intruders. We want to make sure that they're accessed only by those who are entitled to access them, and so on. Again, you can look at personal goals like that or more collective ones. Servers store lots of information and we don't want them hacked into. Uh, companies that keep information on databases want to make sure that they control who has access to those databases. Now, intimately tied to authenticity is the notion of identity, because whenever we talk about integrity and authenticity of information, it means that it's coming from the entity we think it comes from without modification, which leads to the question of who is that entity or how do we identify them? And so that question of identity could be phrased as knowing that the entities I interact with are who they claim to be. So if I receive a text from Alice, uh, I want to be, make sure it really came from her. And uh, similarly, if it's, say, a medical practitioner or a server or website with whom I'm communicating or with whom I'm running some service. Let's look at an example where things like this arise. Nowadays, there's a lot of interest and need to keep medical data online. You can imagine a database maintained by some entity, say scripts in this example, where in the most simplest form, to every possible patient is associated records, so Alice has R sub A, and so forth. Now, if a medical practitioner has an appointment to see you, prior to that, they may go to the database and say, send me uh, your this person's record, and uh, the job of the database is to supply it. After having examined you, the medical practitioner may decide that they want to prescribe something or a procedure or a medication and update your record accordingly. And when that's done, they may want to store back this updated record into the database under your name. And the database is supposed to then replace the old record with this new one. But of course, that is only how it would work if there were no security concerns. There's a slew of them here which manifest the different privacy, authenticity, and identity elements we've talked about, but also show how they're all connected and how we have to think about different aspects of where adversaries have access and what they're trying to do. So, uh, for example, when the medical practitioner receives the record R sub A, it needs to know that it really is Alice's record that was actually sent by the proper entity, Scripps. In that case, we're imagining an adversary that has somehow supplanted that institute. Maybe it intercepted the request for the record and it's itself sending information. And the real Scripps doesn't even have a clue that a request was made. Alternatively, maybe the request was received by Scripps and they shipped across a record. But along the way on the, on the network, your adversary modified a part of that record. And that is another concern for the medical practitioner who receives this record. And those are all questions of authenticity and identity. Then 
the database itself will have security concerns. We don't usually want anybody and everybody to be able to access Alice's record. Medical information is considered uh, confidential. And so the database would like to ensure that who requested it is entitled to that information. So they're concerned about the identity of the requester. Again, that means they're thinking of the adversary as having effectively replaced the medical practitioner. The medical practitioner didn't enter the picture. The adversary pops up and says, please send me Alice's record. How can you make sure that isn't happening? Again, it could be the case that the record was requested. Um, uh, and then the medical practitioner, having obtained it, made the diagnosis and changed the record and is shipping back the um, updated record. Perhaps here we are again concerned that this put request is coming from someone other than the medical practitioner or that it is coming from the correct entity but the information has been modified. The privacy concerns pertain to the content of medical records not being visible into arbitrary entities. We want to control them and see that only legitimate ones obtain it. So there's concern about who sees it, whether eavesdroppers or someone else um, requesting it. We want to make sure that the updates, the diagnosis also remains private. And you could even imagine concerns beyond that. For example, is it really anybody else's business that Alice even had this appointment with the doctor? And one thing we see here is how um, the privacy and authenticity goals are interlinked. So we would worry about privacy, for example, just on the server. The data there needs to be protected from entities that access it in transit. But given that requests are possible, it of course becomes important to restrict the identity of the accesses. Another thing we notice is that when we start worrying about security concerns and the entities for whom these concerns arise, we sometimes have to think beyond those that are obviously visible. This looks like an interaction between scripts and the doctor, yet a lot of the security concerns are actually for Alice and we have to worry about what she needs in this situation. Now, privacy um, raises a question sometimes which is that, yes, you could ask about keeping private all the different things we've discussed, but some of them may seem a little pointless or silly, like does it really matter whether people know what websites you visit or whether you sing in the shower or not? And there are different views about this, of course. For example, Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google at some point said that if you have something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. So effectively, you have something to hide only if you're a criminal. Uh, Glenn Grinwald, who is one of the reporters who uh, cracked the Snowden revelations story, uh, counters by saying, OK, if you say you have nothing to hide, give me the passwords to your, all your email accounts, give me all your text and chat histories, and so on. And when you look at it that way, you start seeing, hmm, they really mean all your email accounts, all your text and chat histories. Now, maybe I don't think anything there is criminal, but do I really want arbitrary people to be seeing what I said in those things? And that'll make you think a little bit. There's many discussions about um, privacy and why it matters out there. And um, you, you can, you're welcome to look at those things and see. But one thing that we see arising from those is that privacy isn't just... Um, some kind of um, luxury or desire. It's something that's important to the functioning of a fair and democratic society. Privacy protects us from abuses by those in power. When we are surveyed, yeah, we have very um, we're less of an in, of an ability and incentive to um, to fight power. And, uh, and hence, it's, it's an important element of, um, of, of the way things function. 
So um, looking a bit closer, here are some of the things that Bruce Schneier, who's a, who's a security privacy guru, said in his book. Um, these are things which by now ought to be fairly well known, but if they're not, it's good to be aware that the amount of information and knowledge about us and what we're doing that's out there and being tracked by various corporations and entities is just enormous. Our cell phone provider tracks your location and knows who's with you. Uh, your online and in-store purchasing patterns are recorded and they reveal if you're unemployed, sick or pregnant. Your emails and texts expose your intimate and casual friends. Google knows your, what you're thinking. Why is that? Because it saves everything and it has sophisticated AI algorithms that can effectively predict uh, what you're going to do. Uh, Facebook can determine your sexual orientation without you having mentioned it in the same way. Moreover, this information is spread around in a network, an econ economic network of, um, of usage, which uses it to do things like serve us ads, sell us information, control our um, desires and thoughts, and all this as part of what um, Zuboff calls the calls surveillance capitalism. Right? Corporations use surveillance to manipulate the what we see news articles facebook feeds advertisements but also prices uh, governments use it to s discriminate censor chill free speech and so on and the paradox is that a lot of the time we cooperate with this thing we don't protect protest about how our information is being mined and used perhaps because we're not directly aware of consequences perhaps because we feel we're getting something in return. And so it's good to look more seriously at these questions and determine um, whether we've actually given up more than we've gained. There's a, um, a more sort of non-technical or, or person on the street, if you will, way of looking at the kind of goals we've discussed in which you describe authenticity as the lock on your front door and privacy as the set of blinds on your living room window. This is an attempt to distinguish these two goals um, in more layman's terms. However, one should be wary of things like this. In the end, debates about this are really debates about terminology. And in order to be able to treat these goals in some useful way and deliver solutions which achieve something that we understand, it's going to be important to enter more carefully into exactly how they're defined and to formalize things like privacy, authenticity, and identity. And that is an important part of what we'll do in this class. And, uh, and that will take us uh, into the question of, um, of uh, formalisms. So adversaries then are um, a cornerstone of what we think about in cryptography. So let's look at them a little further. When you see talks in the cryptographic literature, they are often representing adversaries in ways like this, these little icons or pictures like a little devil or maybe some movie character or something like this. And while this is cute, it perhaps obscures that adversaries are very real. These are not imaginary entities. They are powerful and uh, well-equipped and highly motivated and capable of performing damage. And it's worth remembering this and, and thinking about real ones. We see everyday news stories about different actions perpetrated by these adversaries, uh, from hacking into systems to uh, compromising and influencing elections and many other things that we we don't even know about. Uh, cybercrime is an entire economy as revealed by studies done by the security group at UCSD who went through how the back-end works behind a phishing mail that you receive which asks you to perhaps buy something like Viagra what happens when you click on it and make a purchase? How is your payment processed? How does a product actually arrive at you? 
who benefits and where. And all of this brings out what a large ecosystem there is of um, effectively this adversarial behavior. The Snowden revelations were an important indication of um, the presence and power of adversaries and they showed that certain government entities um, across the world are gathering data and both in ways that are unprecedented and to degrees that are unprecedented. We didn't particularly imagine that the data was being gathered or just what kind of steps were being taken to do so. And this has been a wake-up call for many, many people. So as examples, the, um, there were court-approved government accesses to people's Google and Yahoo accounts, which they may not have anticipated. Cell phone companies would hand over records of customers to the government. Wiretapping was used to, to get information from the channels to the extent that undersea cables were being tapped. Millions of emails and instant messaging contact lists were harvested. harvested. Cell phone locations were tracked. And then in, in, um, within more the range of cryptography, standardized algorithms and software had been backdoored. It was discovered that things had been planted in them which allowed the planters, in this case government agencies, to break them. And corporations were paid to adopt these uh, backdoored standards. Sophisticated malware was created and installed. When you see all this, you start realizing, maybe much to a greater degree, just what one contends with in terms of adversaries. If you want to see more about the Snowden revelations, there's a lot of information. There's this nice movie done by Laura Poitras and featuring Glenn Grinwald, and uh, it's about their meeting with Snowden. So um, in a change of mindset then, let's not, even though we might a lot in the class too, see this adversary represented by these pictures, let's remember that what it really should be viewed at is a well-funded agency, highly technically capable, highly motivated, with lots of human power and lots of computing power, and um, invested in employing um, many different avenues to compromising the security we'd like to get. So in the face of these adversarial threats, one of the mindsets that we develop is called the security mindset. Effectively, it means that we put on an adversary hat and we ask ourselves, what are the risks and threats? How can the system be attacked? And we are critical of security claims. And it's through this mechanism that we start uh, seeing how we need to approach developing secure systems. So as an example related to cryptography, suppose the salesperson of some product comes and tells you our system is secure because it uses 128-bit AES encryption. Now, maybe an ordinary customer would say, oh, well, oh great. But someone who has a security mindset and knows a little about crypto might be a little more skeptical. There are many important questions to ask here. For example, how exactly is AES used? There are good ways to use it and poor ways to use it. And the mere fact that it's somewhere in there doesn't do anything for you. What exactly are the security claims when you say something is secure? What is the threat model? Um, if you have a security claim, is there a proof that it's met? So one needs to go well beyond a, a statement like this. And so one of the elements of this class is to develop this security mindset. So um, uh, be informed about these kinds of things. There's a lot going on with regard to how our information is being used and um, how compromises are occurring. And, um, and it's part of our citizen um, duty, I think, to be somewhat aware of these kinds of things as we move forward. So as a summary, you might, for example, try to name some security concerns you have and see if you can classify them within these dimensions we've discussed, like privacy and authenticity. 
and think about how you might develop a security mindset. Uh, in, in this realm, sometimes the extent to which the threats appear are so extreme that people develop a pessimism represented by these diagrams. Anything in the internet can't be private, and the internet and security are and privacy are just completely disjoint. But um, that's not um, necessarily going to be true. And if, to whatever extent we can, we are we are going to be endeavoring to change it. 